451 is an analyst firm that covers emerging technology. Uh, what that means is that as one of the founding employees, I've spent the last 11 years talking to startup companies and their founders and talking to the VCs that invest in them, the investment banks that sell them and the incumbent vendors that buy them. And a couple of them didn't even get bought but went on to become pretty big companies of their own. It is the most fun job in IT. We're hiring, give me a call. As our name might suggest, we get a lot of our best ideas from science fiction. I read a really good definition of the difference between science fiction and fantasy yesterday. It said that science fiction is about our obsession with tools and fantasy is about our obsession with symbols. And what really caught my imagin imagination about that is that software is both a tool and a symbol. And so creating and using software is manipulating tools and telling stories. It's making and it's, it's storytelling. And as such, it's a combination of two of the most fundamental human activities. If you haven't already read Henry Petrosky's book to engineer as human, I want you to get up right now, walk outside and buy it. Good. OK, you can stay. Werner Vinge, in his book, Deepness in the Sky, has a far future spaceman digging into the uh, fundamentals of the software infrastructure on his far future spaceship. And he notices that the system clock starts just shortly after human beings first walked on the satellite of their planet. And you realize that what he's looking at is Unix. And when I read that, I became a folk historian of software infrastructure. And today, I want to talk to you about our folk heroes. I want to give them some shout outs. Um, if you recognize one of the faces I'm about to show you, please yell out their name. Let's celebrate them. Your fabulous prize for recognizing these people is to bask in the warm glow of basic human decency. The dashingly handsome James Gosling was uh, looking out the window of his office on Sand Hill Road in 1993. And he said to himself, as dashingly handsome software geniuses do, the syntax of C and C++ is awesome, but that shit doesn't port. What's needed is software that will run on what's going to be a proliferation of non-x86, non-Windows devices that I foresee coming out of the sky here on Sand Hill Road. I shall call this language Oak. Trademark disputes meant that he called it Java. It was originally intended for your internet toasters, which, like your jetpacks, are, are held up in shipping. Um, it was later conceived as a way of putting applets on desktops inside these sandboxy virtual machines and, and routing around the deficiencies of Windows that way. How did it end up on servers? Well, the answer is um, it ended up on servers just in time. A bunch of other software geniuses addressed the fundamental deficiency of Java, which was that when you write something portably, it's slow. Um, they created the just-in-time compilers, which compiled only the code that was going to be needed by the application right at that minute. And this is a particularly meaningful moment in software history to me because I interviewed one of the early developers of a JIT compiler, and I married him when we had two children. <laughs> Very moving story. The JITs made possible um, the release of J2EE, Java 2 Enterprise Edition. And, um, in doing so, it created a Cambrian explosion of these amazing pieces of software, the, the early web application servers. Um, I still love the names of them, Bluestone, Cold Fusion, and Hydra, iPlanet, Jetty, Kiva, NetDynamic, Silverstream. Um, and the market killed all of them dead, except for WebLogic, WebSphere, uh, and the open source Geronimo, JBoss, and Jonas. But it was an amazing time, um, because uh, Business had, had finally copped onto the commercial potential of the web. And a whole bunch of, of my generation spent um, years of their life building the first web server farms. It was, it was our Normandy. We crawled around uh, cabling and recabling these monster systems together. It was incredibly painful. And there had to be a better way of doing it. Shout out. The dashingly handsome Mark Andreessen. Um, he uh, started a company that you punk kids have never heard of called Netscape. <laughs> this is uh, why you've never heard of it. This is the dashingly handsome Paul Moritz, who cut off Netscape's air supply, promised to do it, and promptly did it. Leaving poor old Mark out of a job, Mark uh, started the incredibly presciently named LoudCloud. Now, LoudCloud was an application service provider, an ASP, and it didn't work. Um, it, was, it was outsourced IT systems management, and he sold off the not very interesting hosted bit to EDS. 
so that he could focus on what to him was the really interesting bit. Now, the words of advice for young people that, that Mark is going to teach you are, be lazy. Um, he, uh, he, he thought that the interesting bit that he built for LoudCloud was the underlying framework for, um, instead of having to write scripts for every configuration issue that, that came up, he would build this framework so that those scripts could be automated. He, he basically invented provisioning automation as a discipline, as we know. Opsware went on to become a, a fabulous company. Um, Blade Logic came from slightly different origins. VJ and Dev had also gone through Normandy um, cable and recabling web servers. And what they did was they bought a San Mateo-based company called Network Shell, which was basically a bash shell for Windows. So their idea was to bring the enormous power of Unix tools to the um, insane headaches of, of running Windows land. So again, make it portable, be lazy. Uh, these were very successfully uh, learned lessons by, by the automation guys, and that's basically why we have a modern operations profession. We'll take a left turn and talk about this guy, who is the dashingly handsome... Nobody? Mendel Rosenblum. He solved an argument that had been raging for, no lie, 40 years. In the 60s, IBM invented virtualization. In the 70s, uh, two computer science professors, uh, Popek and Goldberg, came along and wrote an incredibly influential paper in which they divided uh, micro microprocessor instruction sets into sensitive and privileged instructions. And if you had sensitive instructions that weren't also privileged, if they changed their behavior based on the state of the underlying architecture but couldn't control the underlying state of that architecture, you couldn't virtualize. 8086 came along in 1978. It had 18 sensitive but not privileged instructions. Everybody threw their hands up in the air for 20 years and said, can't virtualize x86. Wrong. What Mendel did, and why his name will live in glory forever, except apparently with you lot, um, <laughs> is he realized that uh, uh, the number of conditions under which those sensitive instructions would execute was finite. And that meant you could build a software workaround. And it was onerous. It took a 40% performance hit in the first iterations. But VMware was the first to virtualize x86. And the first I heard of it was in 99, when all of my kernel code of friends started using this emulation to run their code um, sandboxed so that when the system, when, when their code came down, it didn't bring the whole system down with it again. M write it to be portable, plan for portability, and be lazy. So VMware built a, a billion dollar business on top of that, and then this guy came along. He is the dashingly handsome. Uh, Werner Herzog. And in between making film, films with Klaus Kinski and, and influential documentaries, he finds time to run Amazon Web Services. Amazon uh, made a lot of our, um, we've, we've got a subdivision that talks to service providers, and the service providers had a nice 10 year run of outsourcing and doing managed exchange hosting, and you know, they're still growing at 10, 20% a year. And then Amazon came along with the cloud, and, and all of the service providers are like, ha ha, it, it, it's just a bookstore with uh, uh, an outsourcing business grafted on the back. And uh, Werner, who's Dutch, laughs at them and says, that's like saying it's a bookstore so that's selling cocaine out the back door. <laughs> Amazon was never built to be just a bookstore. That's why it's called Amazon. It's a fulfillment mechanism. It's a river. And what Amazon Web Services does, what the combination of automation in the Opsware style and virtualization in the VMware style has enabled Amazon to do is to become a river not just of atoms, but of bits. And in mid-2007, traffic to Amazon's bit fulfillment websites exceeded traffic to Amazon's atom fulfillment websites. And we're going to look back on this as a really significant moment in, in the history of software infrastructure. I think we already do. So when I first got to San Francisco, you might be able to tell from my accent I'm not from around here. When I first got to San Francisco, all my friends who did startups would raise their Series A, and then they'd run out and buy a Sun E10K. Do you remember them? They were awesome. Very cool, like a TARDIS, blue lights, humming. <laughs> Five years later, they would raise their first round, and they'd blow it all on a contract with 365 Main. <laughs> These days, my friends who start startups, they skip the Series A. They go straight to revenue generating activities. Um, Bessemer Ventures and Sierra Ventures will not invest in you if you have infrastructure on site. Don't ask. They assume that you're writing everything up in the cloud. Um, and that's caused a big crisis in the VC industry, which is great for me because as an analyst, you know, crisis is opportunity. 
We scratched our heads for three years, analysts as a community, and came up with this uh, three-layer cake, which it purports to describe what the cloud is. The cake is a lie. Um, it sets up a bunch of false equivalences. But it is interesting, and we have to name check it. Um, software as a service, to me, is the second coming of the ASP and the loud cloud model. It's, it's just a hosted application. Infrastructure as a service, obviously a lot more interesting. This is what AWS pioneered with its combination of automation and virtualization, and a whole bunch of stuff that you can't actually do on premise, like um, creating the illusion of infinite capacity through scaling. Platform as a service is gonna be the next big battleground. We've actually got a long form report coming out called uh, the Pass World Wars. Um, and what's really fascinating about platform as a service to me is it's the second coming of the Java virtual machine. A pass is essentially a runtime uh, with a dev env in front of it and a set of application lifecycle tools behind it, but, but it's a hosted runtime. And that's wonderful to me because I still do harbor these nostalgic memories of, of the Cambrian explosion of, of the first runtimes. What infrastructure as a service has enabled is um, revolting developers. We're seeing a, a developer revolt as um, even Stanford's computer science department finds itself competing for the business of its computer science professors with the departmental credit card in an EC2 instance. Um, six week pr physical procurement cycles just are a non-starter. It, it, things have to go much more quickly. And so what enterprises as well as um, uh, other organizations are finding is that they have to build cloud-like infrastructure on site in order that the developers don't just go elsewhere. This is the dashingly handsome Katerina Fake. Katerina. Um, and she's here because uh, part of what's happening with the relationship between dev and ops um, is a renegotiation of the social contract between the two. Uh, Katerina's Ludacorp started out building Game Never Ending, which was a way to um, reproduce your, your physical life in excruciating detail in a virtual environment, just like Second Life or World of Warcraft or Bitcoin. <laughs> and um, much as, as with Second Life and Bitcoin, there was no monetization model be beyond porn and money laundering. <laughs> and, um, and when one of the devs came in one day and said that uh, he had used the Game Never Ending framework to build a photo sharing app, um, Katerina was canny enough to turn the entire company on a dime and create Flickr. And Flickr, of course, um, has been incredibly culturally influential as the place where keynote speakers get all of our Creative Commons images. <laughs> Back to Paul. Um, in the meantime, you know, having, having uh, strangled uh, Netscape's air supply, Paul has started his own company, which he's managed to get acquired by EMC, and then um, in a very Machiavellian bit of, of um, uh, reorg, he, he ends up as CEO of VMware. And um, VMware is under enormous pressure. It's wonderful, market-leading, early hypervisor, now faces competition on all fronts from both open source and from uh, Microsoft, which is its most critical platform partner. So VMware is being forced to climb the stack. And here is how Paul Moritz sees VMware's future. He sees um, leveraging platform dominance uh, around ESX and vSphere into a new um, developer environment around Cloud Foundry. Uh, and he's, he's really reenacting this kind of Oedipal story here. This is, this is what he learned at Microsoft, and he's trying to build another company like Microsoft. And in that picture, Cloud Foundry is key because he has to win hearts and minds of this new generation of, of agile DevOps. Here's how I see VMware's future. I actually think that uh, one of the fascinating things about Cloud Foundry is that it's all open source, top to bottom, and it actually bypasses uh, the old proprietary model of, of um, VMware. I, ha I am on record as having said that VMware, while it's my favorite because I was in at the kill, uh, is probably the last company that will get from zero to a billion dollars pursuing a pure proprietary licensed software model. The future of infrastructure goes beyond proprietary software. It goes beyond Windows itself, where we're already on the brink of a, a post-Windows world. Operations will have to deal with legacy cloud and mobile, and they can only do that by getting in the same room as, as um, developers and sharing their toys and sharing their stories. So I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to be lazier. I encourage you to play more, spend more time talking to each other, and make shit portable. Do it for the infrastructure, but most of all, do it for the spacemen. Thank you very much. <laughs>